in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Merritt Clifton of Animals 24-7. Merritt has been in journalism since 1968 on an animal-related news beat most of the time. He's been full-time since 1988. He was news editor at the defunct Animals Agenda magazine from 1988 to 1992 an editor of the defunct Animal People newspaper from 1992 to 2013. The organization still exists, but the newspaper doesn't. And left that to found the Animals 27 news website with his wife, Beth, in early 2014. His career highlights include receiving the first Environment Quebec Award for Distinguished Environmental Journalism in 1984, and delivering the keynote address at the first No-Kill Conference in 1995 and receiving the Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases Award for its Outstanding Outbreak Reporting on the Internet in 2010. Merritt, I want to welcome you to the show. Glad to be here, Stacy. You've been involved in animal welfare for quite a few years. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share with all of us how you got started and what you think has happened especially for community cats, over the many years that you've been covering community cats? Probably my first ambition in life was, as a five-year-old, to start what I called a kitty farm, which was really, uh, my concept was a no-kill sanctuary. I had learned about the use of decompression chambers to kill animals in the shelters of those days and thought that was an atrocity, and like everyone else, the first thing I thought of was to try to shelter them all. Uh, Within another few years, I realized that this would be an impractical and impossible ambition. So by the early 1960s, my ambition was to try to rehome them all. I adopted a cat from a shelter, and I tried to rehome kittens around the neighborhood and so forth and realized within a fairly short period of time that trying to rehome them all was not going to work either. After after that, my family lived overseas for a year, uh, traveling around in Western Europe, and I took the opportunity to census the cats that were out and about everywhere I went. And that was really the beginning of my interest in animal-related statistics. And I learned how to find the particular habitat areas around campgrounds and marketplaces and cathedrals and so on that would attract cats and how to count the cats that were there and estimate the populations by day and night from what I could see. I'm still only eight, nine years old at that point, but developing techniques. I did not know that nobody else was doing this. So I was yeah. developing techniques in childhood that are now widely practiced but didn't come into vogue until decades later. Uh, by the early 70s, I had become aware of spay-neuter and was trying to encourage that as much as I could. But at that period of time, and for as long as cats have lived with humans, they were basically a friendly outdoor animal, easily tamed wildlife. They were relatively rarely brought into homes. I remember when kitty litter and cat kibble first began to appear in supermarkets, and I was already an adolescent buying baseball cards when I began to notice the cat products in the stores. They had not been there when I was younger. So at that point, uh, in the 60s and in the 70s and on into the 80s, Cats began moving into our homes overnight, full-time, and uh, many people forgot that the cats had ever had an ecological niche and a, a place in human society that was not as a pet. Uh, I've seen really the entire transition from the traditional way in which cats were kept to the present time, not only here, but 
overseas. I, I've worked in you know, more than 40 nations doing research, investigations, and so forth as a journalist, and of course observing and counting the feral cats. Some of those societies are still back in the, the Middle Ages as far as their level of technology, how the people live, where they get their food and water. And of course they have their cats doing what cats did in the Middle Ages. And then, um, so then um, you had some experience with, you said in the 70s was when you started really promoting spay-neuter aggressively on an informal basis. And then going through the 80s into the early 90s, was that when you saw the beginning of the no-kill movement, crafting sort of an organized effort? There had been some no-kill shelters for a very long time. Uh, in fact, the first animal shelter founded in the United States in 1858 was an attempted no-kill shelter in Philadelphia. But the concept of no-kill as a response to population issues didn't really gain any momentum until probably the end of the 90s, and the key part of that was developing high-volume spay-neuter techniques and looking at where the animals coming into shelters came from. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, the animals coming in were primarily owner-surrendered surplus born at home, with some animals picked up for running at large by animal control. As spay and neuter caught on, more and more people were fixing their pets, the volume of owner surrender began to drop off, and at that point, shelter personnel began to realize that feral cats were the breeding component of what was coming into their shelter. The adult ferals were not the ones coming in so much as the found litters of kittens. A litter found at large, and somebody would bring it in, not knowing who the mama was or having seen that the mama got hit by a car. So there really didn't even begin to be any talk about feral cat population control until the fairly late 80s, although some people, including myself, had been fixing barn cats and other feral cats earlier. But that had only been on a, a sort of an experimental basis. It wasn't yet an organized program. So the first organized programs to address feral cats as a population control issue, you could look at the Stanford Cat Project that began in the late 80s. You could look at the Connecticut Project that began in the early 90s. You could look at also in the early 90s simultaneously the project that started Alley Cat Allies. But there were suddenly lots and lots of programs going simultaneously where only five years before there had been nothing at all. And some of the information that some of those groups got from was uh, information from England and how they dealt with their feral cats. So they were doing feral cat spay neuter in the early 80s. Had that been still relatively new in England, too? The technique was actually developed in Africa. The first people to do it, as near as I can find, were in Kenya and South Africa, and it spread from there to Britain and caught on in Britain. The furthest back I've been able to push the use of neuter return uh, as a population control technique by an organization would be the early 80s. But the farthest back I can push it by individuals working on a fairly systematic basis would be in the 70s in and around Johannesburg, Cape Town, and Nairobi. So I'm going to ask you to walk down memory lane a little bit, and can you tell me a little bit about what it was like attending the very first no-kill conference back in 1995? There were 60 of us, give or take a few, in a hotel room in Phoenix, hotel conference room in Phoenix. Richard Avanzino, who is the, then the head of the San Francisco SPCA and now recently retired as the first executive director of Maddie's Fund, had never spoken at a conference before, and I introduced him as a speaker. It's a little hard to believe that that was his first conference, but <laughs> it was. Uh, Mike Arms, who heads the Helen Woodward Center now and was then at the North Shore Animal League, had also never spoken at a conference before, and I introduced him the next year at the second No-Kill Conference. A lot of very well-known names were just becoming known even to each other at that time. The Best Friends Animal Society people attended that conference but didn't speak, and I believe that was also their first conference. I was the keynote speaker, and uh, looking around the room, I was probably the only one there who knew most of the audience. 
as I say, everyone was just getting to know everyone else. Right. But there were several points that I made. I could see that the no-kill movement, including neuter return, was taking off like a rocket. And I saw several different components of it that were working together, one of which was the cooperative relationship with animal care and control, which would continue to do their traditional work of protecting the public from dangerous dogs and disease, especially rabies, but also other zoonotic diseases. And they would have to continue to do that. That's a necessary and vital part of maintaining a civilized society. But the no-kill people could provide a gentle way to help hold down populations and do disease control and so forth without having to kill large numbers of animals. Also very important to recognize was that we could not allow this growing movement to be hijacked by animal hoarders, stockpiling large numbers of animals in the name of no-kill sheltering. This was an issue that I had already been working on and tracking for 13 years at that point. I began doing systematic logging of animal hoarding in the middle of 1982 after covering my own for several cases as a journalist. And I could see that while hoarders often pretend to be advocates of no-kill, they have their own dark psychological drives that don't really have anything at all to do with the well-being of the animals. And I had also seen in the examples of several fairly large quasi-no-kill organizations that had turned out to be fronts for hoarding, that these things, like Justin McCarthy's Animal Farm Home, could do tremendous damage to the image and cause of no-kill sheltering in specific and animal sheltering in general. Because after you have a situation like that where 600 animals turn up dead who are supposedly receiving the best of care, uh, people are not going to want to take their animals to shelters. And they're not going to I, I agree. That image of no-kill has been really challenged because of using that label of no-kill in inappropriate situations. Right. So I wanted to really spotlight what kinds of no-kill operation could be successful. And one example that I always point toward is the North Shore Animal League's idea of taking animals out of animal control shelters and putting them in a mall-type adoption environment and rehoming them with fairly rapid turnover, advertising, boutique-type display, everything that works to market everything else. Now, lots and lots of people are doing this now. This is not a new idea now. But back in 1995, the North Shore Animal League was almost the only ones doing it. They had already been doing that since 1969, and they had been doing it so successfully that they had pushed their adoptions up to a peak of 44,000 a year at a time when the second best in the country wasn't even reaching 1,000. So they were really on to something, but they were really feared, hated, and mistrusted by lots of other people who really didn't understand what they were doing. There was very little understanding of advertising, marketing, all oh, how that might fit in with a no-kill model. And, of course, I talked a lot about the necessity of having high-volume spay-neuter. You cannot get to no-kill animal control until you reduce the populations of animals who, for whatever reason, are having to come into your shelter. And that there are many reasons. that They can be simply a nuisance to somebody. They can be a threat to wildlife. They can be a disease issue. They can be dangerous. In the case of cats, we're not talking about animals who are dangerous to human beings. But in the case of dogs, we most definitely are. And I hammered the necessity of having a framework of regulation, which, among other things, would prohibit breeding the most dangerous categories of dogs. I won't go into that at great length here, but that's a message that has been ignored, and we've gone from roughly 2% of the dogs coming into shelters in the 80s being pit bulls to currently it's more than two-thirds in much of the country. And now, let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Ready to make a big difference for cats in your community? We've got an exciting opportunity that can jumpstart your efforts. The Community Cats Podcast has launched Community Cats Grants. When you qualify for this innovative program, you'll gain valuable knowledge about how to raise funds for your spay-neuter efforts. Plus, we'll match the funds you raise up to $1,000, doubling your ability to make a difference for cats. Fundraising doesn't have to be scary. We'll be with you every step of the way. 
check it out. You can find all of the details on the Community Cats podcast website under our education menu. Let's join forces to make the world a better place for community cats. I'd like to turn the tables a little bit and get your thoughts with regards to the whole concept of community cat. I believe you have a whole different definition of, of how we should call our free-roaming cats and I, I really category. don't like the term community cat because it seems to me to be a deliberate attempt to blur and obfuscate the reality that there are three separate, distinct, very different populations out there, and there's not a one-size-fits-all term for them other than cat. The feral cats are the cats who are living as wildlife. They have their food sources. They have their cover. They are surviving perfectly well without us as they have survived since well before the dawn of civilization. There are certain circumstances under which, as a civilization, we may find it necessary to control their population by methods such as, well, spay and neuter is really the only humane method. So we, we may we may be obliged to do trap neuter return to control the feral cat population in absence of the breaks on their population that historically they've always had, such as competition from other wildlife, a small amount of predation from other wildlife. But basically, they don't really need us. They don't want us. They do their business mostly by night. They mostly don't even like to be seen by day. And most people don't know they exist. There's also the indoor uh, pet cat population. We all have some of those. I have one in my lap right now. They're, (laughs) in my view, the ideal house pet for modern civilization. And I can't say enough good about cats. I love cats. And then there are the cats who are in between. They are not taken care of as cherished pets. They are allowed to roam at large. They create problems that cause neighbors to become irate, to reach for poison, reach for the shotgun, call animal control. Because they are fed, they hunt for sport. And they're hunting, this is one of the things I noticed very early in studying feral cats. A true feral hunts almost entirely by day. This is an animal who is adapted to nocturnal hunting and adapted to hunting rodents in specific. They'll be down in the crawl space under your house. They will not be on the sidewalk hunting birds by broad daylight because that's a very inefficient way to hunt if you are hunting for a living. But if you are a fed cat and you can hunt for sport, then in effect, you become a trophy hunter. You're out there, you're trying to to bag the hardest bird to catch. That's the challenge. And that's what makes bird watchers go crazy and what. It's what gives cats the image of being relentless killers. It's not every cat. It's just the the cat who is irresponsibly kept by a, a human who is very often unaware of the extent to which this cat is perceived not as a, a nice, friendly pet by the neighbors, but as a threat to the, the birds that they're trying to feed, watch, photograph, or defecating their petunias, or whatever. Now, I can go back in time to when I was a boy and an adolescent and a young man, and every cat roamed at large. We, as a civilization, as a culture, we have changed that norm so much that now the uh, pet cat roaming at large is seen, I think, by most people as abnormal, and not desirable, and if you're responsible, you get your cat fixed and you keep your cat home. I don't think that that's an impossible goal. We've gotten so far with it now that to abandon it in favor of a community cat's idea that we should have cats all over the community is a giant step backward. I think that, you know, we still have to keep an eye on what our objective is, which is to reduce the overall population of free roaming cats that can be rehomed or have another opportunity. And basically, obviously, through the spay-neuter component, that's going to naturally reduce the population on the streets. But anytime I've gone in and done a targeted project within the first two to three years, 
you see 60% of that population being reduced because of exactly. the trade, the key word you used is targeted. those kinds of things. The key word you used is targeted. You survey out the area, you fix every cat in it as rapidly as you can. What I'm seeing being done in the name of new to return and particularly in the name of community cat projects now is exactly the opposite. It's scattershot. It's fixing a few cats here and there, and meanwhile that's a pretext for somebody to feed cats. You feed them outdoors in a park, a schoolyard, some other place where they're problematic, and that's not TNR. That's keeping outdoor cats. But I agree. I mean, whenever I've entered into a targeted area that has had controversy, saying, oh, well, we've been feeding the cats and we've got a TNR project going on here. Every time I've gone in, it's 20 of the cats are spayed and neutered and the other 80 are not. And so obviously there's going to be nuisance problems and there's going to be, you know, volume issues and that kind of thing. And so if you do commit to a targeted project, you will be successful and the nuisance complaints will go down and they will be your greatest praisers too. Right. So I think if I could wrap it up in a sense, I'd say that if animal hoarders are the enemies of no-kill sheltering, cat feeders, in many respects, are the enemies of successful neuter return. Because Mm. very often what they do is they build community resistance that then makes it difficult to impossible to conduct a program properly and effectively. There definitely are challenges for the the, the larger um, picture. And And I think that it is important for any program to have an objective and goal about how to create a humane community for cats in general, whether they're indoors or outdoors, and address that issue. Before we run out of time, I want to also touch upon some of the issues and a little bit of the history about the sort of birding cat controversy. You touched upon it a bit earlier, but I didn't know if you wanted to expand uh, a bit on some of the history. Yes. Uh, You happen to be located in a community which is the home area of a very influential 19th and early 20th century ornithologist, Edward Howe Forbush, who was the first Massachusetts state ornithologist, and he hated cats. Through his writings, example, and influence, hatred of cats in general and cats at large became more or less institutionalized in U.S. conservationist and environmentalist thought pretty much right from the beginning of there being organized responses to environmental issues. Now, this did not happen in England or anywhere in Europe or any of the other places where there are interactions between feral cats and birds. This is a pretty uniquely American attitude, and it was through Forbush's influence that it became entrenched here. But Forbush, as it happened, was actually a very poor observer, and he was a much more influential writer than he was an observer. If you read the things that he actually wrote about cats, he fairly consistently conflated things that cats did with things that raccoons did, He did not know the difference between a feral cat and a bobcat, and he very often misattributed to cats things that were done by the predatory habits of birds. He didn't seem to be aware that birds other than hawks, owls, and eagles were predators. So when he visited the offshore islands around Cape Cod and found whole nests destroyed and the remains of the young scattered all around, the remains of roseate terns in particular, he did not realize that this was the result of attacks on their nests by other seabirds. And even though he didn't find any cats, he said this was the result of there being cats on these islands, which led to a determined effort to purge cats from really any place where people were trying to protect bird populations and bird habitat. So we are fighting his legacy? Yes, organizations such as the American Bird Conservancy are directly descended from the writings of Forbush. They're not well-grounded scientifically, and people like Peter Wolf have done a very good job of destroying the papers and so forth that come out by Peter Mara and so forth with grossly exaggerated feral cat numbers and grossly exaggerated estimates of predation. 
but it really all goes back to just this one guy who unfortunately was in your backyard so many years ago. <laughs> In the in the Massachusetts backyard, and on the you said he was up on the North Shore, which um, the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society was founded up in Newburyport, Mass. And Merritt and I have known each other for since the mid '90s, and it's been a privilege to uh, keep in touch with you on and off over the years. Merritt, if people are interested in finding out more about you, how would they find your organization? www animals twenty four hyphen seven dot org o r g or right. on Facebook just look for animals twenty four hyphen seven we're covering animal issues twenty four hours a day seven days a week including That's a lot of things great. about cats yeah as I'm thinking here about all the stuff that I've known from you over all the years I and mean, we haven't even touched upon statistics and when I think of you, I think of you sort of as the, the father of statistics. You used to, with the animal people, have these great lists of performance in the different states around the country and that kind of thing. So I think that we'll have to we'll have to save statistics for for another show. But you are a wealth of information in, in that area. But before we do close, do you have any uh, parting thoughts or words of wisdom for our listeners today? Well, only moments before going on the air. A free roaming cat was run over right in front of our house. Not a, oh. the whole neighborhood gathered and looked. None of us recognized the cat. Not a cat from this neighborhood where we fixed the ferals years ago. And my wife Beth, who's a former vet tech, picked it up and examined it, and then I carried it into the woods and laid it to rest beneath the ferns. A coyote will get a meal and not prey on a rabbit tonight. But this sort of underscores why we don't want to have free-roaming cats in broad daylight. This was either somebody's pet or it was dropped off by somebody irresponsible from outside the neighborhood. We don't as yet know how it got there, but this is what we don't want to see. We want cats to be, if they're feral, safely in their nocturnal environment, away from the roads, doing what they have always done, or pet cats, we want them to be safely in homes, not wandering out into a busy road. I couldn't agree with you more. Mayor, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today, and hopefully we'll be able to have you on again in the future. I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats Podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 